Morning. 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 It is great to be back with you guys. Truly love coming here and appreciate the welcome. Uh, I'll begin just by saying thank you. Thank you, Early Church of Christ, for your partnership with EEM. It means more than I can even express to have great partners like you. Uh, as you can probably guess, it's been quite a year for us uh, with the war in Ukraine and all the uh, ripple effect of that. I want you to know that this morning my objective is not for you to leave here saying, wow, what a great ministry EEM is. That is really not my objective. My objective is for you to leave here today saying, wow, what a great God we serve. Amen. And that is truly what I pray we accomplish. Uh, the title of my message today is A Tale of Two Crises. Uh, but before we get to these crises, just a little bit of truth. Uh, we live in a broken world. Anybody notice that anywhere <laughs> around? Lately, lately, the evidence is all around us all the time. And it's very clear. And it's exactly in times like these when we need to be reminded of what Jesus told us. He said, hey, in this world, in this broken world, you will have trouble. But he didn't finish there. He said, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. Jesus has overcome the broken world. But still, here we are living in the middle of it, right? With uh, storms, difficulties, trials, crises. So, let's go to our two crises. Crisis number one. A little EEM history here. Go, let's go back seven years ago, uh, actually November of 2015. Our executive team is getting together to put, to put together the budget for 2016, and we're hearing on the news. You, you might remember this. We're hearing on the news about a very serious situation developing in Europe. There's a war in Syria. You remember this? And it, this has triggered a mass exodus of refugees flooding into Europe, Muslim refugees coming from Muslim countries, uh, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iran, Iraq, Syria, several others. Millions of Muslim refugees flooding into Europe. Now, of course, the media is all over this because they're Muslims, right? So they're all terrorists, of course, right? And so there's this huge security threat to the entire European continent and even the United States, right? The media is good at making you afraid. Okay. And we're hearing about this, but, you know, we're thinking this really doesn't have anything to do with us because we're Eastern European mission and these refugees are coming into Greece and to Western Europe. So, you know, this really doesn't have anything to do with us, right? And then God goes, hey, lift up your eyes. And we get a phone call from a guy in Athens, Greece. And he says, hey, you guys are the Bible people, right? You get Bibles to folks. Yes, that's what we do. Do you have, do you have any Bibles in Arabic or Farsi? And of course, our response was, what's a Farsi? <laughs> no, that's not. Really, I'm sure we knew exactly what they're talking about. That's another language, right? And we said, well, no, not really. We're Eastern European mission. We don't have those languages. And he said, you've heard about this huge uh, situation, all these refugees flooding into Europe, right? Yeah, we've, we've heard about it. Uh, the, the, the refugee crisis, crisis number one, right? And, and he said, well, we have here in Athens, Greece, we have a ministry, and we believe in reaching out to and caring for those in need, those that are hurting, the, the marginalized, the disenfranchised, et cetera, et cetera. And so 
you know, these refugees, a lot, uh, millions of them are arriving on the shores of a Greek island, Lesbos Island. And it looks a lot like this when they arrive. And so we literally have a team that is there on the shores greeting these people and welcoming them as they get off the boats. And then we take these people, you know, they, they have fled their countries because of oppression and hate and anger and terror. And they've had it up to here, so many of them, and they fled, not knowing the language, not knowing how they're going to be treated. They're just basically saying, well, it can't be any worse than what I, where I live right now. So we are greeting them and welcoming them as they come off the boat. And then we have a huge tent, bigger than this room, uh, where they uh, receive medical attention, check their vitals. We had, there are doctors and nurses that are volunteering there, and they help uh, make sure that these people are okay physically. And then there's places for food, warm, dry clothes, basic humanitarian aid. And he said, here's what's happening. Here's why I'm asking for Bibles. And I've told you guys this before, but I'm reminding you this morning about crisis number one. Many of these refugees, first of all, they're Muslims, and so they're, they're kind of shocked. <laughs> it's like, now, you're, you guys are Christians, right? Yes. How, how can you do this? <laughs> we thought you hated us. We were taught to hate you. So how can you do this? And these workers are trained to say, very simply, it's because of Jesus. It's because of Jesus that we do this. And then many of these people, they're moved and they're touched. And suddenly, the very foundations of their life are shaken. Because they've been told, they've been lied to. They realize that. They've been told all their lives, Christians are horrible people that hate you. And suddenly it's not true, and the foundations of their lives have been shaken. And when that happens, people start looking for some solid ground. Right? The kids have already left, so they can't help me with the song, right? The wise man built his house on rock, right? Rock's Jesus. And they realize their houses have been built on the sand. And so, he said, he told us, he said, Muslims are coming to Christ by the thousands. Okay, how many times in your life have you heard those words? Go ahead, I know the answer. You could say it, right? You've never heard it, right? <laughs> but now you are because it's happening now. More Muslims have come to Christ since 9-11 than in the previous 1,400 years combined. And so, I'm thankful that our executive team said, hey, we don't have any Bibles in Arabic and Farsi, but we're going to get you some. Because since then, EEM has supplied more than 400,000 Bibles in five brand new languages for us. Uh, Arabic, Farsi, Urdu, which is Pakistani, Sarani, which is a language of the Kurds, Bibles to Kurds, and Turkish. And we get to participate in the most spectacular work of the Holy Spirit I have ever seen. Story after story after story of conversions and churches just exploding. When I met, these, when I met uh, some of these refugees uh, five and a half years ago, there were about 25 of them. Earlier today, more than 600 met, and that's just one. And it all started with a crisis. Isn't it funny how God can turn a refugee crisis into a refugee opportunity. How great is our God? 
If you, if you would have asked any of us on September 12th, 2001, <laughs> the day after 9-11, this, our response would have been, yeah, that's impossible. Funny thing. God does that kind of stuff. And now you get to see it. And not just see it, but get in on it. That's crisis number one. All right, crisis number two. It's November of last year, a little over a year ago. Our executive team is putting together the budget for 2022, which is always kind of funny because by February 15th, the whole thing, we have to throw it out anyway because <laughs> God's going, you guys are funny. <laughs> um, anyway, that's another story. But they're putting together the budget, and we're hearing some rumors and whispers a year and a month ago that maybe Russia is going to invade Ukraine. Of course, we're very concerned about this. And then on Wednesday night, February the 23rd, I am on the road, actually, in uh, San Antonio. I do a presentation like this on a Wednesday night, come back to the hotel, turn on the news. It's early morning in Ukraine, and the invasion has begun. And it, it's war, and it is horrific. I've been to Ukraine several times. I've uh, met people. And so many of these people, first of all, they're a beautiful people, and they are strong. Anybody notice that? And they want freedom. And they very, they very much want God in their country. We're putting Bibles into their schools. You guys know that for 10 years now. I've visited these schools. I've met kids, students who thank us. I've met teachers who thank us. I've met principals who thank us. I've met librarians who thank us. We've met Ministry of Education officials who thank us. Because it's changing their country. And it's been agonizing to watch. I actually went and Googled and saw one of the schools where I had visited and took a selfie with some beautiful students. It completely destroyed. I visited that school. More than 800 schools have been destroyed so far in the war. Big military targets, right? And I had a guy uh, that talked to me after a presentation way back first of March when the war first started. A guy came up to me afterwards and he said, wow, what, what a shame, this war. What a shame. And it is. And he said, man, what a shame because you guys have done so much work in Ukraine, you know, and, and now this, this, this is a war. And you, it'll probably shut you down in Ukraine and maybe some of the surrounding countries as well. And then God tapped us on the shoulder, said, hey, lift up your eyes. And I'm reminded of Isaiah 40, and I'm going to kind of switch this a little bit and put it into the, the first person. It's kind of, kind of like God said to us, do you not know? Have you not heard? <laughs> I'm the Lord, the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. I will not grow tired or weary. My understanding, no one can fathom. It's kind of like, hello? <laughs> not that God is happy about war. Of course not. But didn't we just learn a few years ago that God can take a crisis and turn it into an opportunity to show his glory didn't we just learn that? Okay, you ready to hear about how he's doing that? Okay, there's your build-up. <laughs> this is going to be fun. Here we go. Uh, most, a lot of you guys know this guy, Sasha. Sasha has had a weekly TV show on Ukrainian national TV now for more than 20 years. EEM has uh, partnered with him, supported his ministry, provided Bibles to all his viewers who uh, requested Bibles. We partnered with him a long time. When the war started, we got our Kiev, our Ukrainian team, our staff, out of the country. We'll come back to them in just a minute. But Sasha and his son Vanya stayed in Ukraine. 
And after the first couple of months, they were in Kiev, and so they were basically just kind of hunkering down and trying not to die from a bomb or missile, right? After a couple of months, when the Russian troops withdrew from Kiev and then moved out to the southeastern part of Ukraine, Sasha and Vanya emerged, and they said, we want to be useful. So they said, let's go down to the EEM warehouse and make sure it's still standing, and it was. And still is, thank God. And so they got, we, we, they called us and we got them keys. They got in. And as you can see, th- there are lots of Bibles in the boxes, on the pallets, shrink wrapped, ready to go. We had an order when the war started, we had a, an order for 22,000 Bibles and children's Bibles to be distributed into public schools in western Ukraine. So, Sasha and Vanya, the TV guy, and Vanya, a teacher, said, uh, Let's, we'll become your warehouse workers. And they got the dollies, loaded them up on the dollies, took the dollies, loaded up the books onto the trucks, and then drove those trucks hundreds of miles Uh, Their driving skills improved greatly. (laughs) Going around huge holes in the highways from bombs and debris. Not without risk. To get Bibles to people. To give hope. In the middle of a crisis. Every Bible that EEM had budgeted for and had planned to distribute in 2022 has been or will be distributed. Not one book will be missed. Yeah, it really shut us down, didn't it? You can't can't shut God down. Okay. Okay. They also driven many <clears throat> refugees who wanted to leave the country. They dr- they've driven, driven them to the border. Our trucks have been on the road. And speaking of people leaving Ukraine, you are aware of a crisis, not just the war, but the crisis, the ripple effect. There's another crisis, humanitarian crisis, of millions of Ukrainian people displaced within Ukraine and then leaving Ukraine and and flooding into Poland, Slovakia, Hungary, uh, Romania, Moldova, several other countries, creating another humanitarian crisis. I want to report to you, first of all, a lot of these surrounding countries Churches, ministries, nonprofits, other organizations have rushed to the border to help and welcome the refugees as they cross the border. And there's medical attention, and there's food, and there's water, and there's warm, dry clothes, and there are diapers, and there are uh, hygiene products, uh, et cetera, et cetera. It's a humanitarian aid. Does any of this sound familiar? Okay, and our, we have moved our Ukrainian team, this is them, wish I had time to tell you a story about each one of them, to Vienna, got them out of the country to Vienna, and our Ukrainian team are now overseeing a new channel of opportunity that EEM's been involved in since the war started of raising money, funds, to provide humanitarian aid, to send to ministry partners that we've worked with for decades, Right? When the war started, our executive team and board thought, we at EEM are uniquely positioned to help with this because we know people. We've worked in all these countries for decades. You know when the war started, there were a lot of nonprofits and organizations asking for money to send for humanitarian aid. You remember all that? And sometimes you don't know who you can trust, right? Well, EEM... We believe we present a face that you can trust 
and then we know people on the borders that we can trust. And so we've been receiving donations to send to ministry partners providing humanitarian aid. Nearly $2 million has been raised in addition to all the other money that we've raised for Bibles. And our Ukrainian team are overseeing the dispersion of funds, which is, I think, a beautiful God moment. They are involved in something that's very dear to their hearts, of course, their people. And they're doing a great job. I can tell you more than 100,000 refugees have been served so far through donations give for humanitarian aid. And in the middle of this is something very remarkable. Okay? This is awesome. This is a picture of, in Bucha. It's a suburb of Kiev. If you kept up with the war at all, you might remember uh, after, when the Russian troops withdrew after the first couple of months, Bucha is the first city where multiple atrocities and war crimes were discovered. The epicenter of the worst of the war. And here's a very poignant picture, I believe, uh, family who's received just basic humanitarian aid in front of the burnout bombed building. I could show you a lot of other pictures from Bucha. I'm not going to do that. But in the middle of this is something very remarkable. Many of these refugees, many of these people, they received the humanitarian aid and then they're asking, hey, do you guys have any Bibles? In Bucha, this is one of my favorite pictures I've ever put on a screen. Sweet little lady in Bucha, in the epicenter of the worst of the war, receives her humanitarian aid and then says, hey, I hear you guys have Bibles here and receives the first Bible of her life. It's also happening in other places in Kyrgyzstan, Ukraine, where the, probably the worst of the fighting has occurred in Kyrgyzstan and four different suburbs of Kyrgyzstan. In Bielsko, Biala, Poland, this is a refugee family that fled from Kiev to Poland. They received humanitarian aid Immediately said, do you have any Bibles? We sent Bibles and teen Bibles. That's Emma and Diana. More than 10 tons of humanitarian aid, 10 tons, has been sent to uh, organizations and ministries working in Poltava. Bibles also in Poltava. In Bilosika, Ukraine, displaced refugees receive welcome bread from a church there. That's the basic uh, Ukrainian tradition to give uh, to welcome strangers is welcome bread. Uh, Bibles have been requested. People came back and asked for more. In Sopot, Poland, humanitarian aid, Bibles. In Bratislava, Slovakia, there's pictures of humanitarian aid followed almost immediately by Bibles. What we have learned as we begin to send money to ministry partners providing basic humanitarian aid, we better be ready to follow that up with Bibles. Now, I don't know. In fact, EEM has sent humanitarian aid funds to 15 different countries, a star beside each one. And in every case, we're following that up by request with Bibles. And you, please understand, uh, for example, we don't have Bibles in Poland in the Ukrainian language, right? Or in Bratislava, Slovakia, or in Estonia. So we're shipping Bibles in the Ukrainian language to 15 countries that are not named Ukraine. <laughs> so let's just say we've had to be really agile this year and shift our printing and distribution strategies. And, and I'm just telling you, I'll tell you this, God, God is good. 
in the middle of all the challenges. We will distribute this year not only the every single Bible we planned to print and distribute in, Ukraine, in the Ukrainian language, we'll, percent, we'll, we'll print and distribute two and a half times that in 14 other countries that are not named Ukraine. So the war has not shut us down. The war has increased the opportunity. Does that sound like God to you? Amen. I'm sorry, but I'm not finished. There's more. Are you ready for this? You might ought to hang on to your seat. There's more. These are three teenagers from Mykolaiv, Ukraine who fled along with their mom and dad to Bratislava, Slovakia, received humanitarian aid with mom and dad, then received Bibles. This is those three teenagers right after their baptism. Two weeks after the Bibles arrived. This woman, Svetlana, fled from Zaporozhia, Ukraine, to Warsaw, Poland. One of our partner ministries there cares and serves her, cares for and serves her. Humanitarian aid Then she asked for, receives a Bible. Two weeks later, baptized into Christ. Uh, the young, this is Diana at the same location in Warsaw, 14-year-old uh, Diana. Uh, in Estonia, uh, young refugees from Mariupol somehow end up at the Baltic Christian Youth Camp in Estonia. Receive Bibles there at the camp or baptized into Christ. Displaced people in Chernivtsi, Ukraine, receive humanitarian aid, then Bibles. Two weeks later, baptized into Christ. Um, everybody knows where Transnistria is, right? I didn't either. So. You might Google that. It's really fascinating, truly. But we uh, received uh, a request from uh, Igor, who's the preacher of the church in Transnistria. And they had uh, uh, refugees, five refugees from um, Mariupol, Ukraine, that uh, the church went on a retreat together over the summer. And they had received humanity. We'd sent humanitarian aid to the church there, and they'd help the refugees. And uh, then uh, they received Bibles right after that at the retreat, five of them baptized into Christ. And Igor finishes a thank you letter to us just by saying these refugees have found hope in Jesus. And what I'm sharing, uh, you understand, is just the tip of the iceberg. I can't, I can't share all the stories. I can't do it. Uh, we'd be here for too long. We're maybe here already too long. I don't know. Uh, let me just ask you this. Do you think war will decrease the need for the Word of God? You can do your head like this. It, are any of us surprised? Yeah, I was maybe sometimes a little surprised. But truly amazed, what we've learned once again, first of all, when the foundations of people's lives are shaken, they start looking for some solid ground. And a refugee crisis becomes a refugee opportunity. And then the second thing, just to remember, what was it that unlocked the door for the, for the work of the Holy Spirit among the refugees. Followers of Jesus just serving and loving in Jesus' name. Just serving people that are hurting and needy. And suddenly the, the door is unlocked. What is happening here with these Ukrainian refugees? Same thing. Does that tell us anything about what we need to be doing here? Do you think that it's possible that God might be able to, I don't know, turn the tables on the crisis that we face in the church of Jesus Christ in America? Do you think that's possible? Amen. How do we unlock the work of the Holy Spirit to let, to let that happen? What do you think? Love and serve people in Jesus' name. Do you think there's any power in that? Hmm? We at EEM believe strongly because of what we see, because of what we experience, 
we feel it's incumbent on us to share these things with the Church of Jesus Christ in America. Okay. Let me just show you a little bit. Uh, ooh, those numbers are tiny. Hope you can see. This is a chart that shows, uh, just to, to let you know uh, how things are going in 2022. <laughs> this is the chart of our growth uh, since 2013. Total number of Bibles, books distributed in each year. Can you see that? in 2013 distributed a total of 211,000 for the year. We've had a little bit of growth in 2021, record year over a million and a half Bibles, books distributed. So how's it going in 2022? Well, first of all, uh, August 22 was the biggest month in EEM history and distribution. Through the third quarter of 2022, EEM has already distributed more than we did all of 2021 through the end of the third quarter. We are only up so far in 2022 uh, about 37% versus where we were this time last year. We're probably looking pretty close to 2 million this year. In the middle of a war, inflation, supply chain issues, which are real. <laughs> and I got to tell you, we're talking about 30 different countries here. Let me just, let me bl blitz through these in a hurry for you. <clears throat> Bibles into public schools. I've been telling you about that. This year, we'll distribute Bibles into the public schools of eight different countries at their request. And they're teaching Christian values in their public schools. Eight different countries. Ukraine, Romania, uh, Croatia. Serbia, Hungary, Lithuania, Bulgaria, and a brand new country, first time this year. You're going to love this one. North Macedonia. Do you know that was a country? I didn't. We got a call from the head of the public schools in North Macedonia saying, can you give us Bibles for our schools? We heard you're doing a great thing in Croatia. I have a friend there. Can you get us Bibles in Macedonian? And so we did. We have literally heard the Macedonian call. How fun is that? Huh? <laughs> From a church, got to move. Uh, from a church reaching out to Muslim refugees in Greece, to children's Bibles being distributed in Bosnia and Herzegovina. From a ministry to orphans in Romania, to a network of orphanages in Kazakhstan. From a retirement home in Siberia, to the first modern translation of the New Testament in Slovenian since 1588, presented to the president of Slovenia. From a prison ministry in Hungary, to a ballet camp in Prague. And even in Russia, the kingdom of God still breaking out all over Russia. From a ministry to women and children in crisis in Moscow, led by this beautiful woman, Nadia, to a ministry in St. Petersburg. Are you ready for this? What they do is they help homeless alcoholics detox so they can go to rehab. You want to just get that picture in your mind? Anybody want to volunteer for that one? Believers in St. Petersburg, Russia. You talk about ministering to the least of these. From a ministry uh, reaching out to Roma, Romani refugees in London, to that small church going on a retreat together in Transnistria. Now you see a Bible icon coming up here at every location that I just described. You can see this kind of the scope of our work. It's more than 4,000 miles from London to Kazakhstan. Oops, sorry. It's more than 2,500 miles from Estonia to Greece. So, and 30 different, 30 countries so far. The logistics of this whole endeavor are, to say the least, complex and challenging. 
supply chain issues are affecting us, uh, of course, to say nothing of a war. But in all of this, I can report to you. Jesus said, ask and seek and knock. And we are, and just like God promised, we are receiving. And we're finding. And doors are opening. Five dollars gets a Bible in the hands of one of those people. Average cost. Thousand dollars will fill an average size school. Um, you guys have partnered for years and helped provide Bibles and helped plant the seed of the Word of God into hungry hearts and hungry souls. It is completely so opposite of what it was when I was growing up all over our geographic footprint because people are open to the gospel. They're hungry for God. They want a Bible. They, when they, and then when they get one, they devour it. We are seeing this over and over and over again. So while, man, while the soil is good, we got to be planting a seed. Let's pray. God, this morning, I, I just want to offer praise to you. You are the great and awesome God. Um, yeah, God, I, I wish I could say that these things are happening because EEM's really, really good. <laughs> but I know, I know. We do the best we can, but we're weak. and uh, you, We are in this just because you have been gracious enough to invite us to participate. Because this is your ministry. This is your work. And we are in awe. Thank you for the invitation to participate, to get in on what you are so clearly doing. And Father, I pray for the people in Ukraine. I pray for peace. I pray for the people in Russia. I pray for peace. And I pray for your power to be on display in the midst of whatever crisis comes over there or in our lives to show how great you are at turning crises into opportunities. In the name of Jesus, and amen. We're going to sing a song in just a second here. Um, maybe you've come today and you're moved by the love of God expressed and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ and you want to come and do that today and be baptized in his name. Let this song be your opportunity to come down and let somebody know that. Or, or if you've come today and you're just wrestling and hurting and struggling and you just want somebody to pray with you and pray for you, let that be your opportunity. This song be your opportunity to come let somebody know that as well. You have that kind of neat thumb while we stand and sing.